Hello and welcome back to Catching Flies Podcast. I am Stephen Burton. Joining me as always, he is an author, a fantasy football manager. He has 47 tattoos. He is the Greek philosopher, Pete Makatis. What's going on, PD? Catch any flies this week? Oh, it's all about catching those flies. Well, <laughs> uh, 47, it's a bit much. I, I'm not going to pretend I got zero. Uh, uh, <laughs> Sad to say, I don't know the exact number. I've done a couple of combination tats, and I, <laughs> I think count. I've got 25, 26, something like that. Uh, my fantasy football team did get a first-round bye into the playoffs. For you. Thousand back from the five-game losing streak I had earlier in the season. Hello, everybody. Welcome along to the Catching Flies podcast. We have a great show in store for you today. We're going to be talking some Major League Baseball. Before we dive into the show, though, uh, this morning, came across some unfortunate news in the world of college football. And, you know, we did a college football show last week. We are big college football fans. But we're sad to hear that the uh, head coach of Mississippi State, Mike Leach, has passed away from a heart condition brought on by a heart attack that he had a few days ago. Uh, Leach was head coach at Texas Tech for a long time. That's where most people got to know him. I'm a Big 12 guy myself. That's where I got to know him. He spent some time at Washington State. He left both of those programs better than when he got there. And the same can be said for his short time at Mississippi State. Uh, what are your thoughts on Coach Leach there, Stephen? Yeah, it's a sad Tuesday morning here. Uh, woke up to the news, and I'm not necessarily the biggest Mississippi State fan or Texas Tech fan or Washington fan, but um, many people don't realize that he has revolutionized the game of football on the offensive side. Uh, he was the first coach uh, to really implement a high-octane passing attack, uh, spread teams out, and just throw, throw, throw. Um, so a lot of the concepts and, and plays that he invented, created, you know, you'll see uh, a lot of pro teams running, a lot of college teams running spreads today. So uh, he, he had a huge impact on the game of football and uh, a sad day for for his family, for Mississippi State fans and just the game of college football as a as a whole. And we just wanted to give a little shout out to Mike Leach. Uh, thank you for all you did for college football and may you rest in peace. Absolutely. That, that air raid offense. Uh, he definitely came up with major a major part of those concepts. A lot of Kentucky fans out there will know we got to start with Hal Mummy, who right. uh, was kind of the guy who got the ball rolling on that, but Leach made it what it was. And while he was at Texas Tech, it's fitting that the basketball coach there was Bobby Knight. Uh, <laughs> they have a couple things in common besides, you, know, you might say their temperaments are similar, but they also did it without the big star players. I mean, yeah. think about who Texas Tech or any of – any of Mike Leach's quarterbacks were during the, during those times. The most successful ones were probably Graham Harrell and Cliff Kingsbury. That's who exactly have, who I was going to say. Yeah, yeah. And they didn't have big NFL careers. And that's Not a testament all. to Leach in my mind, because he was able to get the most out of them. You know, Bobby Knight was the same. So the three best players of Bobby Knight probably had that turned pro were Isaiah Thomas. Okay. That's an outlier. Sure. That dude's obviously a legend Hall of Famer. And then, like, Quinn Buckner and Calvert Chaney, maybe. Jared Jeffries, maybe. maybe. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, yeah. He didn't have that wealth of talent. He's still a three-time national champion, including, to this date, still the only undefeated, or the most yeah. recent, I should say, undefeated NCAA champion all the way back in 1977, even before I was born. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, those guys had a lot in common. They both have big-time legacies. Our thoughts and prayers definitely go out to the Mississippi State family, to the Leach family, anyone who's ever known him, anyone who's ever played for him, anyone who's ever been touched by him in any way. It's it's a loss, and um, we're sad to see it. We're sad to see it happen. Uh, we're wishing the best for everyone involved. The one one last thing, if you get if you need a good laugh, and this is what outside of a great offense, Leach was going to bring you. Go, I, I challenge anyone. Go to YouTube. Google Mike Leach interview and you're going to have a great time. Yeah. You never knew what this guy <laughs> was going to say. 
He has some of the uh, most iconic, just off the wall answers to answer uh, the questions after games, you know, and you never knew what he was going to say or do. He, um, he was a great character of college football and helped make it so special. So he definitely will be missed. Absolutely. Uh, thank you for all those thoughts and thoughts do go out to the Leach family. As we mentioned, we do have a Major League Baseball show in store today. Now, it's very clear that it's December and we're not playing Major League Baseball at the time at this time. But uh, there are some things we want to discuss as it pertains to baseball as a whole. And in general, we want to look at the economics of baseball. That's going to be kind of our focus for this episode. There has been a spate of signings over the past few weeks and a month or so, but especially here lately. I'm just going to run them down real quick. Just going to, I'm not going to hit every single signing, of course, but some of the bigger ones, some of the ones that went over $10 million a year, especially multi year contracts, just run them down. And then we're going to discuss a few of them in relation to the economics of baseball. So Jose Abreu, former AL MVP, three year, 58.5 with the Astros. The Jacob rich DeGrom, richer. right? Jacob DeGrom, five year, 185 with the Rangers. Taiwan Walker, four year, 72 million, Philadelphia. Josh wow. Bell, two year, 33 million, Cleveland. Mitch Hanniger, three, four, uh, three year, 43.5, San Francisco. Jamison Tyon, I hope I said his name right. I think I did. Yep, I, think I did. You did. Okay, good. <laughs> four years, 68 million, the Cubs, Wilson Contreras. Five years, 87.5 Cardinals. Kenley Jansen, Unreal. two years, 32 million Boston. Masa, Masataka, pardon me, Masataka Yoshida hasn't played a game of Major League Baseball yet. Five year, 90 million Boston. Justin Verlander, two year, 86 million uh, New York Mets. I heard that is uh, the second highest a- annual value contract of all time. Is that I think Zach Greinke may have him be or Scherzer or somebody. Yeah, it's it's huge. I think it was Scherzer who signed just slightly more for two yeah. years. I mean, forty three million a 43 year. Million a year. We're but talking two the... million a start, probably. Right. Wow. Yeah, you'd hope you'd hope about one point five million <laughs> if he can stay healthy. Yeah. Right. But these are the four we want to concentrate on for the time being. Uh, these are the big four in regards to their length. Did you get Trey Turner's in there? I'm sorry. This, this is where we're getting to. These big okay, four I was going to say, I yeah. thought you were done. <laughs> <laughs> the next four are all very long contracts, and we're going to discuss okay. the merits of those. Aaron Judge, nine-year, $360 million with the Yankees, age 30. Xander Bogarts, 11 years, $280 million, San Diego Padres, age 30. Brandon Nimmo, eight year, one hundred sixty-two million with the New York Mets, age twenty-nine. Trey Turner, eleven year, three hundred million, Philadelphia Phillies, age twenty-nine. So I'm going to ask you this question, Stephen, and you you hack away at it as long as you'd like. Two part question: Why are some of these contracts so freaking long? And part two: Are they good contracts? Well, I'm sure you heard there, I, I couldn't help but laugh at a few of these uh-huh. and, and just be blown away. Uh, you know, Brandon Nimmo getting, you know, he's a, he's a good player. I ain't going to lie. He's, he's a very solid player, but what a massive overpay. Um, you know, you're getting fourth, uh, I would say like a fourth or fifth overall pitchers for rotations getting st- Four year, eighty million dollar deals, and like Taiwan Walker and and Tyon, these are some of the craziest deals that I think these teams are really, really going to regret over the next few years. I mean, will some guys work out? Yeah, of course, a few will, but most will will bomb huge, especially when you're talking the 10, 10 11 year deals. Trey Turner to me is probably the best shortstop in the game. As far as just everything, I love I love the guy, but there's no way I would have given or liked to seen my Braves give him 11 years, three hundred million dollars. I mean, no no contract that's 10 years plus has ever worked out for the team. I mean, look at Albert Pujols, mm-hmm. and now look at where the Angels are because of it. Yeah, they have two and all time great players, but literally nothing else to go with it. 
And a lot of it has to do with the, the massive Pujols deal. Uh, you look at Miguel Cabrera. Mm -hmm. He was an incredible MVP, you know, maybe a best player in baseball for a year or two. And then, you know, he gets this, uh, I believe his was like 12 years from the Tigers. And just the last seven, eight years of that deal, you're massively, massively overpaying a guy who – for what he has done already, not for what he will do. And uh, most of these teams really end up suffering, which is fine with me because uh, a couple <laughs> of these teams are in my Braves division, so I hope the Mets and Phillies do suffer from this. Uh, but in the immediate, they are better. They're going to be better for a year or two, maybe three at mo uh, you know, for sure. But, you know, five year five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten – usually these teams really don't get close to the value that they're paying the guy. So I think it's a, uh, it's insane, but when one sport has projected to spend three to $4 billion in free agent, I mean, this is why we wanted to do a show, right? Like, you yeah. know, mm -hmm. uh, it's uh, incredible. I, I didn't realize Aaron judge was 30. He's that, always that, sneaky old. He got a later start. Like, that's yeah. That reminds me of like Max Freed. Uh, you know, he he's been a great left hand pitcher for years, but uh, he didn't get called up. I believe till he was like twenty seven because he had Tommy John out mm -hmm. of nowhere, and it just kind of you know delayed it a, a year or two. And you know, he's never gotten paid yet. But uh, wow, I I really didn't know Aaron Judge was uh was thirty already. It seems like he just got to the major leagues like two years ago like, it seems like it doesn't it but he was in that uh thick of the mvp race with uh jose altuve wow and then in 2017 uh, when there was you know the whole juxtaposition of a guy six foot eight and a guy five, five foot right. six I remember <laughs> going that. wow so that, he's finished I his sixth season um, i can't believe it was that long ago yeah, already <laughs> i know time flies when you're cheating right Astros, I, well right? you know <laughs> it's a whole different topic uh but yeah it, it on the face of it Let's just take Aaron Judge's deal right now. This is a dude that just, I don't know if it was unanimous, but if it wasn't, it was very close uh, to win the AL MVP this year. And he beat I don't a guy. know how he couldn't be unanimous yeah, this year. Well, whenever Shohei Otani's there, someone's going to be voting for him. That's fair. And yeah. uh, to so clearly win an MVP over a dude like Otani, who is by definition the most valuable player. He's considered in baseball. the greatest player of all time by. Uh... I, uh, not bolster only, but the other insider, Jed Passan. Okay. He, he was on McAfee saying that, uh, last week. That yeah, given Otani the totality is the greatest of his, player of all time. Yeah. Given the totality of his contribution, that's tough to argue. Maybe, you know, no one can pitch and hit like him. He said right. ever. And that's, that's true. So when it's talking about value, but at the same time, judge won that MVP. He set the American league and the New York Yankee record for most home runs, did it with a good batting average, finished second in the league by percentage points. On the face of it, yeah, any contract Aaron Judge signs looks like it's going to be good. And I'm going to echo your point uh, that at the beginning, the first two years, three years of, the, of, any, of all these contracts, they should look pretty good. Right. You know, who says Judge can't hit another 60, 62, 64, 68 and home runs? probably will. This year, you know? While, at least again, 50. playing a decent all-around game, uh, he's not just a power hit. He's not uh, Ryan Howard, who just right. bombs it, and that's it. Judge is a decent base runner, a decent defender, great average hitter. Uh, his OPS is through the roof, all these things. The average baseball player starts to decline at a certain point, no matter who you are, and his decline might still be better than most players in general, but you're going to be paying a dude $40 million when he's 39 years old. Even when uh, he's 36, 37, yeah. 38, I mean, and when he's 40, like, that's where these teams really get hurt. Yeah. They, yeah, I mean, Trey Turner's contract goes till his 40th, until he's 40. Uh, Xander Bogart's least 41. Yeah, that's that was the one that blew my mind. I had mentioned to you uh, uh -huh. another pass, in fact, uh, that San Diego – they're just it seems like they just have an endless amount of money and uh you know jet pass and a ton that they're the 27th ranked media market for a that that classifies them technically as a small market team mm -hmm. and now they have soto they have machado they have tatis 
and they have uh, Bogarts now. And it's like, where's all this money coming from? How are these teams doing it? Especially teams that haven't won a World Series in the last, you know, year or two, three. Um, it's pretty fascinating. Uh, baseball has has definitely the highest salaries of any sport. They're fully guaranteed deals, and that's where these teams are really getting trouble. I feel like with the uh, ten years, and uh, you know, a lot of them have no trade clauses or mm-hmm. no opt out deals and stuff like that, and. It's just truly fascinating the, the amount of money and and years these teams are throwing around right now. Yeah, and as far as no trade goes, baseball has that unique rule where if you're in the league for 10 years and with your team for five, you have an automatic no trade clause. So right about when these right. contracts maybe start to look sour, that's right. when the no trade <laughs> kicks in. So, um, yeah, as far as total contracts, baseball, I would think, has the large, but basketball probably has the most annual uh, yearly value and that's partly because the rosters are smaller you have right. fewer people to pay so your big big superstars can make 40 plus million guarantee you, but for as far as like you're hearing someone sign a 360 million dollar contract you're thinking it's in baseball if it's just right, the top absolutely it, you know? and that's what we're getting. someone like bryce harper signs a or mike trout one of them is like, i think they both went over 400 million in total value um baseball unbelievable and, so uh, Mahomes yeah. was the only other four hundred million dollar man, right? And uh, that's a lot of NFL salary cap trickery added to it. So, right. <laughs> uh, you can't always trust a, a football contract. Uh, baseball, basketball, those are guaranteed contracts. If you sign them, you're getting paid somehow. Football so now, is uh, ways out of those contracts. If I'm not mistaken, Aaron Judge is is the owner of New York, so he's going to change the name to Aaron Judge City. He might. And, <laughs> He's uh, popular enough. As uh, as the owner, you know, I mean, you know, San Diego, they're they're pretty much doing the same. They're giving all this money to to a few guys, but it's like you got to have a great team around it. So, you know, I guess where I wanted to go with this was, uh, do you think any of these teams that are kind of selling out to sign one huge name or two huge names, you think they're going to do better than the teams that, you know, bring them through the farm system, put them on the field, play them. If they're I mean, good, yeah, sign it's them. A, it's a big question, isn't it? Um, we want to state right from the beginning here that we don't necessarily believe that money will buy you a championship. But it won't. So look, I mean, at, the look at the Yankees. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I mean, they last went to and won a World Series in 2009. They have gone right. 12 straight seasons without even appearing in the world series i mean their record ever so you know they started off and they were nothing they broke through in the late 1919 1919 season basically is when they picked up babe roof and they brought up uh, a bunch of other guys they made their first world series in 1921 won their first one since 19 in 1923 since that time the longest they've gone without a world series is 18 years the longest they've gone without an appearance is 15 years and we're, we're hitting we're getting closer to inching closer to both of those numbers here Right. Um, the Dodgers spend money like drunken sailors. Absolutely. Uh, and they have one World Series to show for it. And even that one's just, you know, it was a 60 game season, you know? They got real lucky that year. I would think recall. so. And they've gotten unlucky. Down three years. to one. Down yeah. three to one. Down three to one in the NLCS. We the ran players. out of gas. Yeah. We ran yep. out of gas. Uh, but even Speaking they don't have of- a whole lot to show for it. You will see teams like the Royals win a World Series. The the Rays make it to a World Series. There are still possibilities for some of these teams. But this is uh, the, this is what uh, what else is funny about baseball. Last year, the Pittsburgh Pirates had a payroll of twenty eight million dollars. <laughs> There's five players in the league that make more than the entire Pirates team combined. Yeah, yeah. unbelievable. I mean, like, only in baseball. That's what I was told. Or, okay, so yeah, going off that read. number, uh, four different guys off this list I just mentioned signed contracts with a high right. <laughs> average year value. We have DeGrom, who's, uh, let's do the math real quick, $37 million a year. Uh, Verlander, Verlander 43, Judge, right. 40. Turner kicks in at just around 28. Right, yeah. so he's right there as well. Yeah, I mean, that is it, nuts. I'm not sure about Devers, what his – uh, or Bogarts, I mean, what his was. But, uh, yeah, I mean, only in baseball. 
<laughs> yeah, so only in baseball can you have, you know, major league clubs with uh, major league players making more money than in other entire teams. Like, yeah, it's yeah, unbelievable. Put a pin in that. That's something we're going to come back to. Uh, but regarding what they're going to do this season, to, to directly answer your question after <laughs> after going on a bit right. of a tangent. Sorry about sure. that. Sure. I mean, yeah, they have no choice but to be better as long as these guys stay healthy. Um, the the one contract that really raised my eyebrow was Nimmo. Uh, yeah, again, that was a good player. Wow. We're not going to deny he's a good player. The dude has no, played in 100 games twice in his career. Right. Every other Always season, hurt. he's fallen short of 100. In both of those seasons, he cleared uh, – well, in one of those seasons, pardon me, he cleared five war. He just did, and war is not the be all end all stat in baseball. It really isn't, but it's a nice, it's a nice uh, guidepost. And he had five point one war last year, four point six war last year. Here's a baseball reference: their estimation of how many wins above replacement players that a player is worth, and five is considered a, a very strong year. It's like an all star, oh, yeah. type year. So he went four point six in twenty eighteen, five point one last season did 3.6 in 92 games in 2021 and this is mostly coming from his offense uh he's had a few years his last couple of years he had positive defensive war but every other year minus his rookie year he was uh negative he's a nice player he really is but he's signed for 20 and a quarter million dollars a year on average through age 37 and I'm no expert on baseball contracts. I know football contracts will do this. Uh, this is something the 49ers have done to decent success before. They will front load a contract. So let's say Aaron Judge signs nine year, three hundred sixty million. Dale's that average is forty million dollars a year. Obviously, like the way the a front loaded contract works is we'll pay you sixty million for the first three years, and as the contract goes, it'll diminish in value which would make a lot of sense because a player generally will diminish in value as well. I don't think, I don't think baseball players would go for that. If these, if, if these guys can get you to sign them to 12, 11, 12, 13 year contracts, then they can pretty much, you figure they have control over what's in there. Um, yeah, it's truly unbelievable. Yeah. But yeah, the Mets were strong this year. They were leading the East almost all season. Until they weren't. <laughs> That's right, and, yeah, baby. <laughs> they bring in Nimmo on a resign. Uh, Verlander, Jose Quintana is someone else they signed. That was a very good signing. Yeah. I, I would have loved the Braves to pick him up. You know, He's two year, twenty six million. That's a very good yeah, contract. Thirteen there. million a year still, but no, that's um, very good value. Yeah, the Mets are going to challenge. And that division's crazy. You got the Mets and the Braves each won a hundred games, and oh by the way, the Phillies that won the National League. Uh, San Diego have even been in the playoffs. Well, you know. <laughs> San Diego again made the playoffs, made the NLCS. They did it without Tatis. Who knows where they're gonna keep him? That's a different story. Yeah, um, that's uh very surprising. Yeah. When you when you uh brought that up to me off air, I that really intrigued me because I hadn't thought about that. You know, they they brought in another 30, 40 million dollar year yeah. player. How are you going to have four or five of those? Like yeah. usually you can have one, maybe even two, but the Padres are really pushing it. And, uh, you know, I just wonder if Tatis doing, you know, his antics and immaturity may cost him dearly. And maybe they, well, I mean, he's still going to get the money, so I guess it won't cost him anything, but they, they might have to move him, right. you know, for some pitching or just a little relief in the cap. They because the there is, is – well, as we were going to get into, it, there is a there. There's not a cap, but there is a cap. You can go over it. There's penalties. I'm sure Pete's going to do a great deep dive here, but uh, it's just very interesting. To me, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, if they trade him, it's probably going to be about sixty cents on the dollar. But um, oh yeah, well, it's going to have to be because to get any kind of top prospects or great players and then have to pay that money too, teams aren't going to go for that. You right. know. Mm-hmm. So. Uh, the other theme about these contracts is the teams that made these deals. I said the Mets a lot. I said the Phillies. I said the Red Sox, the Mets, the Dodgers, even the Rangers. Um, the Cubs threw in a couple deals, the tie-on deal. They got Cody Bellinger, $17.5 million for one year. See if they can reclaim him. 
you're not seeing the pirates on this list. You're not seeing the reds on this Royals. list. You're not seeing them. The Rays, they gave Zach Eflin three year, 40 million. That's mind blowing numbers for that franchise. I think it's the largest contract they've ever given out. Um, I was going to say, did they ever pay price or Longoria? Cause not I was like that. I mean, that. Those yeah. guys wind up leaving. I mean, right. Uh, you don't see the Royals on this list. Uh, you don't even see the White Sox on this list. Um, certain teams control these contracts, and there's a reason for that. And baseball's economics, as we want to get into a little bit, dictate that there are haves and have-nots. Um, I don't know if that's good or bad for baseball. There is a There's two schools of thought here. There is the school of thought that parity is the best thing for a sport, that at any given moment, in any given year, a team can come through. Look at the Cincinnati Bengals last year. You know, and they did it by signing a few free agents, like a Trey Hendrickson type and uh, Von Bell in a previous season. These guys, if this was baseball, would never have signed with the Bengals. They'd only be going to certain teams. And anybody can come through. So there's the argument for parity. But then there's the argument for having a few dominant teams that would make the top top half of the sport more interesting because there's always going to be a, a bottom half of the league. You know, even with parity, the Texans are going to be bad this year. Oh, they are bad this year. Uh, the Lions were bad last year. There's always going to be a bottom half. So with that said, you want your top half to be as strong as possible, and that makes for great intrigue. The NBA's golden period was the 1980s when there was like six good teams, and that was it. You know, It was the Lakers, it was the Celtics, the Rockets, the – Pistons came along and that made it, you know, potentially more entertaining. Those two schools of thoughts have been crashing into each other in baseball for years, going back before the 94 strike. So the fact that someone like even Wilson Contreras, who was a very, very good player, not somebody that got an 11 year contract, but the fact that he signed with the Cardinals as a matter of, of fact, Rival. you know, yeah, a the rival, but biggest like, rival. Right, but wow. he was never signing with the Rockies. No. You know, he was never signing with the Pirates. There was never a chance of that. Is that good for baseball? I think the problem with some of these teams is the the ownership and uh, you know, a lot of these rich whites have sat back for years and years and collected checks and and refused to put any money into their stadium, refused to put any money into their team. They're okay with losing 100 games every year because they know they're going to make, you know, X amount of money. And, I mean, we're talking – I'm sure the owners are still making hundreds of millions of dollars from uh, con TV contracts, you know, just ticket sales and everything. So, you know, they, they just don't – and Pittsburgh refuses to put any money into their team. The Rays, uh, until Wander Franco, has basically refused to put any money into their team. Even if they do have an incredible year where, like – the Royals win it all or the Rays go to the World Series. Like, those teams always get blown up the next year. Mm -hmm. um, the Marlins have won two World Series and had been set up for the future. I mean, they, they had some great teams, and then they just blow it up because, you know, they, they have a certain they have a certain cap number they don't want to go over, and their owner just refuses to do it. What can you do? I mean, uh, I think – I think for the sport itself, it would be be better if, you know, um, some new ownerships took over a Pittsburgh, took over a Colorado, took over, you know, Kansas City, Tampa, uh, especially Tampa. You know, being down there in the warm and, and everything, like you would think a lot of players would want to go down there right there on the ocean. I went there last summer. It was beautiful down there. No but, state tax. Uh, that too is <laughs> huge, you know, but uh I think I think that would be the best thing baseball could do would be get some aggressive new new owners in that are willing to make the game better. Uh, that way there is more competitive balance because some teams every year have their division one before the season even starts because you you just know you know like like this team's not going to be any good. They they haven't been good for thirty years. Like they're just not. Yeah, they might win a few games here and there. It might even be beat, beat, beat us once or twice, but at the end of the day, they're going to be 50, 60 games under 500. And, or, you know, so I think uh, baseball as a whole 
whole would be would be better. But a lot of it too is a uh, one power agent brokering all these deals. You know, you got Drew Drew Rosenhaus, no, Scott Boris, you know, and yeah. mm-hmm. uh, or Scott Boris yeah. is the is the king. Like you know, I mean, literally all of the big name guys are his clients mostly, and. You know, it seems like they do always go to the Yankees, the Dodgers, the Red Sox, the the big money market teams. And till more people get in, things are going to stay the same, you know, till till more owners get in, new owners get in. It's going to be the same every year. You're going to have the same 10 to 15, maybe 10 to 12 teams competing for the playoff spots and the real contendership. All right, and you know, uh, again, people will try to throw in the examples of other teams breaking through and and succeeding, like the Royals. The Royals came through in 2014, made it to the World Series, barely lost it to the Giants, ran it back the next year, and and won the World Series. Some of these smaller market teams are able to temporarily give off the the impression of a bigger market team, where they will make some midseason trades. Uh, they turned themselves into buyers for that one season, I, but the Royals were nowhere near contention last year. So it's more no. of an outlier. It's more of an exception than it is part of the game. I would even call my Braves a small market team uh, to a sense until they actually won that World Series and spent money last year. Uh-huh. You know, prior to that, we were never going over ninety-five to a hundred million at the very, very most, which sounds insane. You know, a hundred million dollars, but <laughs> when you're making a baseball team, that's not a lot. Well, that's and about four when you're million comp- per player, yeah, right. And when you're competing. At, uh, you know, and we usually had great players. Let's be honest. We've had a lot of great teams. We've been spoiled a bit. But at the end of the season, when we're playing the Dodgers or we're playing, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, some big money market team, the, even the Mets in our own division, mm-hmm. you know, they, they might have a two, three hundred million dollar payroll. Now, how can a team that has a three hundred million dollar payroll, you know, or uh, go against a twenty million dollar payroll team? How can they compete? You know? It's very tough. You got to have, you know, just elite young players. You got to have great scouting departments and you got to draft well. And then baseball, that's how these, those uh, fluky Royal teams and Tampa teams were created. Incredible scouting, incredible drafting, and you got to hit, you got to get lucky, find some uh, all-stars, uh, you know, sign some, some kids from different countries that end up being huge that, that were, you know, just completely no named, so to speak. So my overarching thought on this is just going to be, it's, it's wild. It's not like other sports where, you know, there is a certain cap number like football. You, if you go, you can't go over this, this number. And when you got these 40, $50 million payroll teams trying to compete with now uh, with the implementation of uh, TV deals, you know, three, $400 million teams, just, it seems impossible. Yeah, and that's a transition to kind of the last topic of discussion in this uh, overarching theme is should baseball have a salary cap? And with salary caps, the salary caps aren't some magic number that everyone makes, that someone makes up at the beginning of the season. A salary cap is a percentage of gross product from the league. So in the NFL, I believe it's something like 48% of revenue goes to the salary cap. That means revenue sharing. And that's where baseball teams draw the line. And that's why baseball's never had a salary cap. We mentioned the idea of a luxury tax uh, that the uh, MLB somewhat randomly imposes on teams as far as the threshold. Uh, it seems to be an arbitrary number. I don't know where they come up with it. Uh, right. If you they... go over that, you pay a certain tax. Right, it's like fifty cents for every dollar. You Something over. like that. So all you gotta so, do is just bump up right on it and, and avoid it. But, it's not like that. It's not like it makes you cash poor to be under that. Uh, right. Luxury some tax of these threshold. owners don't care. They'll, yeah, some of them pay, don't care. Pay to get that player and and win a championship and try to make it up off of World Series revenue, right. more home game revenue, 
you know, more playoff game revenue. And they do. So they're like, oh, I don't care. You know, like uh, right now, Golden State Warriors were at one time like the highest luxury tax team in the NBA because, you know, they had all them all stars and they didn't care because they were winning titles. But baseball is a little different. They hit a little harder. And uh, but if you've got an aggressive owner at the end of the day without a cap, they don't care. Yeah. And like I was trying to say, uh, these luxury tax thresholds aren't low. They're very high. So when you're when you're scraping up against that luxury tax threshold, you're still paying more in payroll than you are for than a vast majority of other teams are. So, you know, if the Red Sox, Yankees, Dodgers tend to go slightly over or if they don't go over, they're still crushing you in that department. You know, the department of how much money we're spending on our on our team. So like we said, football really Except for a small handful, I think everyone coming into this season understood the Texans were going to be terrible. And I think a lot of people put the Bears right. in that category, too. And probably even the Falcons, who probably have an outside chance of winning their division. The Giants were being put into that category, and they've been in the playoff picture every single week. I think this week they're finally eighth, but they can still easily make the playoffs. Teams can make the playoffs almost every year. You know, minus a handful of exceptions. Again, we're going to use the Bengals last season. They were number one pick two years prior, and then they're in the Super Bowl. And it's not just because of Joe Burrow. You know, they bought a lot of other players that they brought in. They built a team, and they were able to win their division and break through into the playoffs. Who's to say that a team like the Lions can't be in the Super Bowl next year? It can happen. Who's to say the Saints don't bounce back and make the Super Bowl next year? It can happen. The Pirates ain't going to no World Series this year. The Diamondbacks ain't going to no World Series this year. This is not going to happen. The no closest way. thing baseball had to a breakthrough this past season was the Orioles. And uh, even yeah. they missed the playoffs. They they right. overachieved. They overachieved. Don't, don't, don't get it twisted. They had a great year, especially considering what was expected of them. They maybe had the best year. And then they sold at the deadline, too. Right, and they sold at the deadline. (laughs) And they still got better somehow. (laughs) But again, that's more exception than rule. So, again, we're going to ask the overarching question. And neither of us, Stephen and I, aren't going to have this answer. If we did, then we would be commissioner of baseball. But is baseball better off for this model as compared to other sports? We will say that baseball is not america's number one rated sport anymore it hasn't been for a while football has been king for a while but baseball might be behind basketball even and we're talking about america's pastime this is right. a sport that america everybody in america knew who well, obviously who babe ruth was but they knew who phil rizzuto Ty-Kah. was too right, you know, yeah. we're talking about a guy who is not at you know you mentioned Ty Cobb, obviously everyone knew him. These are the guys at the top of their sport, the top of the sport. Phil Rizzuto was not quite the top right. of the sport. They still know who he is. Everybody knew who Sandy Koufax was, and of course you could argue top of the sport. But uh, all the historic moments in 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 America that have come from sports have come from baseball. Jackie Robinson, Hank Aaron, Babe Ruth. Henry. Oh, yeah. uh, these things that have captured the attention, even Sosa and McGuire in '98, it captured the country's attention. I remember that I was I was eight years yeah. old, and our our teacher every day we was we would uh, get a live look in when if they were if either team was playing or McGuire or Sosa was coming up to yeah. to bat. Everyone was in love with that. They were watching it. You know, just what a great summer. I mean, even this year, Aaron Judge comes up to bat. They're yeah. cutting away. You yeah. don't see that in other sports. Um, you know, mm-hmm. NFL records fall every season. You know, you didn't cut in to see, oh, Patrick Mahomes has a chance to break the touchdown record. It's just that, that the right. love affair, the connection isn't there with other sports like it is with baseball, yet it's lagging. And I think part of that is I, uh, I think Americans in general – I can't speak for every one of them, obviously. When sure. it comes to their sports, they want a little bit of parody. I and agree. And if baseball had a little bit more parody, I think it could attract more people. I'm not saying it's the right move for them. 
I'm just saying that could take place. But then you look at something like college football, where this season accepting that parity is not necessarily a thing. You know, it's always Bama, Clemson, Ohio State, Georgia. That is that kind of combination. Even this season, two of them are are there. Right. Yet college football remains exceedingly and they popular. Really wanted three there. <laughs> yeah. Well, they did, but you know that's beside the point. <laughs> yeah. No, I just. I was just going to say, I, I think baseball is working on that um, before we actually get to the whether we think they should or not. I think they're implementing some new rule changes. I think some of it has to do with Americans being uh, so uh, they, they can't focus on long term things anymore. Like th- watching a three and a half hour game can be tough uh, in baseball where at times there's not a lot of action per se. You know, if you've got a dominant pitching matchup or you know, just one, two, three inning after one, two, three inning, it can become a little tedious, but uh, they're implementing new rules. Uh, pitch count uh, this year is going to be huge. You can only throw over to first base, I believe, twice yeah, uh, right. with a batter. If, if, if a guy gets a hit or a walk or whatever and is on first, you can only try to throw over twice and catch him. And then after that, you know, you can't throw over or, or it's a balk, I'm assuming, and, uh, you know, guy's going to get to move up a base so you're going to see more steals come back to the game you're going to see some more small ball which i think will help some of the small market teams for sure um so they're they're trying to implement some changes and make the game a little better but there's definitely lagging no question they want their parity but they won't do the one thing that would get the parity right which is the salary cap and again the salary cap is something that has to be uh negotiated that has to be uh settled between management and the union collectively bargained, I guess would be the the more accurate term. Um, it's never going to happen in baseball because you got guys that can sign right. 11 year, $300 million contracts right. and, and destroy it an entire team's payroll. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's very, I'd be interested to know how many teams can beat the pirates payroll with two players. Cause I'm sure that number would skyrocket. Oh yeah. Absolutely. You know, uh, I would that's think almost close an to half. Yeah, I mean that's a that really is almost a, like to the embarrassment point. You know, you're you're really not trying to be a professional team at that point. Like, come on. Um, I personally, I would love to see a salary cap. I think the only like fair-ish way to do it would be to set it at like a pretty high number to where some of these big market teams that they would need time to clear that clear space to get to that number. But if you do like a 250, $270 million payroll, that should be more than enough. Like, uh, I mean, the Braves just won a world series, you know, two years ago now with, with 110, $115 million payroll. Uh, and that's, that's fairly modest, you know? Well, part of that's how uh, genius they are distributing their contracts. <laughs> right. Well, that, and it goes back to the scouting and the, and the, uh, you know, the development of guy, young guys, your farm system and bringing them through there where you got the team control and, you know, getting a little in the weeds there, the way some of these contracts work, where it's a lot different if you just go out and sign a guy, you know? So, but, uh, you know, I, I just, I wish they would put a cap in, just because it's it's tough to root for a team who's who's got an owner who you know he has a certain number say 100 million I'm not going over it I don't care who's available I don't care how good we are and how could we how good we could be you know I'm not going over that number and then you see teams like the Yankees and Dodgers that are they're like seemingly endless and the luxury the luxury tax they don't even care about that either so it's like essentially nothing to them they'll spend 350 million dollars for a team if they believe it'll get them a world series because they know they'll make that money up on the back end in big markets like los angeles or new york or, you know etc right and um that's what do you much think? the state of baseball i mean you got your haves you got your have nots uh do you want to live- see a cap and implement it or it's would, never or you're not in no it's never well, I, mean, I, I don't believe it will either but no. if you had a magic wand would you prefer to see it so that's a tough question because in baseball or in, a, in the idea of a salary cap i know the nfl does this there's also a salary floor 
So even if there's a salary cap and let's say the Yankees and the Red Sox have to give up a player or two, sure, there's nothing to say that those players are going to go to other teams that we wouldn't expect, the Pirates or Diamondbacks, those kind of teams. Whereas right. in football, you know, because there's revenue sharing that every team gets a certain amount of money despite what kind of attendance figures they have and what kind of revenue they bring in otherwise. So a salary cap without a salary floor is almost meaningless. I agree. So there. that's where I just can't see it working in baseball. They should I, have like, had, so the question was, if I had a magic wand, magic wand, yes. Right. I would, but then the practicality of it just would not work in baseball. And so it right. makes it so unique and it can make it, you know, exciting I feel like when the Royals were making their run, everyone was rooting for them. You know, right. they're the underdog. It, it does everyone add that element. Underdog. It's kind of like the NCAA tournament. You're rooting for Loyola because they're, they're right. middle school and they're made the final four. Oh, my God. You know, things like Florida that. Golf St. Peter's. Yeah. yeah, St. Peter's got all the love last year, except from a lot of people that we know that are Kentucky fans. Kentucky fans, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but other than that, you know, I think most people had the love there. So it's kind of fun to see an up-and-coming team come through. Sure. But at the same time, you know, at the end of the day, it's going to be the same teams. Even if, again, we mentioned the Yankees and Dodgers aren't exactly pulling in the World Series the way one might expect them to on paper. So right. the over uh, to me, the final analysis is that baseball is not broken by any means. Baseball no. is still, besides it being a wonderful sport and being a Beautiful traditionalist game. and a historian myself of sports, baseball is always going to have that place in my heart because the stories of baseball crush the stories of every other of sport, not just because of how far back baseball goes, because of the uniqueness of, of the of... game itself. But um, the the game's not broken, but there's a lot that can be fixed. And... I'm going to say that Manfred's not the guy to do it. Rob Manfred's in charge of that. We all know he's not the guy to do it. But I'm not sure there is a guy or a girl to do it. It's just baseball's economics are different, and they're worth diving into. They're worth looking at, as we have. You know, Hopefully we did that to, to everyone's satisfaction here today. We're not going to fix the game in one conversation. Sure. We're not going to We're not going to even have a proposal to fix the game in one conversation. And I say fix in a manner of speaking because, again, it's not broken, but to improve, to enhance. Some of these rule changes might help. Um, there's going to be the haves and the have-nots, and you get used to it. You're going to get used to it. The Yankees are going to compete every year. Dodgers are going to compete every year. Maybe you get lucky and the Reds compete one year if you're a Reds fan. Maybe you get lucky one year and the Royals come through or the Tigers can come through and compete for you. But those are the teams you're looking at. Yeah, hundred uh, percent. I I almost think like you said, uh, a salary floor would be a better implementation than a salary cap. Like set it to where you know you got to spend at least fifty million. If you're not going to spend fifty million on your payroll, then you got to be forced to sell the team. Like quit being cheap. And then like you said, uh, even if there was a salary cap, there may be a few players leave a couple teams, but there will be a trickle down effect because you know like the top market teams would lose some big names to the medium market teams. The medium market teams might lose a few of their like pretty good players to sign a star player. And there it's going to trickle down to a smaller team, you know, so I think it would help, but uh, yeah, overarching, overarching thought is basically the big market teams are always going to be the big market teams and everyone else is going to try to play catch up. Uh, and, and with that, I think we've, we've broke down, baseball <laughs> <laughs> we broke it down without breaking it i'm proud of us <laughs> right right i love the sport uh the game is to me america's game uh you know like you met, had mentioned henry aaron and uh you know how, mu how much baseball is meant to america you've got pro baseball players fighting in wars you've got uh you know everything from the race uh, racial stuff and and the two white guys running on the field when henry aaron hits a home run to break break Babe Ruth's record and he even admitted like first I was afraid they were going to try to hurt me you know mm -hmm. but then I realized they were just celebrating with me it helped bring America together 
and in segregation and stuff like that. Like, and no other game has really done, done that per se, like uh, Jackie Robinson did with baseball. And to me, baseball will always be in my heart. And uh, I, I love the game. It's a beautiful game. Um, it's done so much more for this country than people really uh, understand, I believe. Absolutely. And we want it to thrive. And yeah, uh, definitely. Whatever two cents we can toss in to help that. Uh, we'll, we'll toss in four cents. How about that? We'll put in double time effort. Uh, right. We, yeah, we, I love baseball too. Um, done a lot Before of extensive we research. Up, promote your yeah. book. Yes. You, yeah, this uh, man wrote a book. When I say he's an author in the intro every week, you know, it's a silly, fun intro, fun way to start the show, but it really is true. true. <laughs> this man wrote a hell of a book on baseball. And if you're an analytical stats kind of person, you need to get his book. Pete, take it from there. Tell them where to find it, what what the name is, all everything. Yeah, it's actually uh, the, the baseball. It's a couple years old now. And it, the idea behind the book is a, a historical look at the game. Try to rank the best careers in the game. Uh, it's silly to rank the best players. There's no way to determine who the best players are. But there right. is a way to rank the best careers. And even the tiniest slivers of differences add up in those in those conversations. But, you know, I did my own statistical analysis over the entire history of the game. Uh, thank God for Microsoft Excel. Uh, <laughs> because there's no <laughs> other way to organize that. Uh, the book is available by contacting me. Um, it's not readily available in any other uh, platform at the moment. I do have some stuff on Amazon. That's a whole different story for a whole different time, but the baseball book itself would be contacting me. Um, it's not necessarily available at the moment just because I'm trying to get it updated. And once I get it updated, it'll be there. But if you want to talk baseball with me, you always can. And if you uh, wanted to know which players I have ranked ahead of others, as far as their careers go, um, you can always come up to me with that. I think the idea is I'm eventually moving all to YouTube and just do a series. Cool. Uh, but that's yeah. that's in the long away future. Um, That'd be well, a thank fun you for video. bringing that up. Yeah, yeah be like 100 to 90, 90 to 80. And, yeah, you know, Stuff this like man that. created a formula and created. He's being a little modest, you know. Uh -huh. I know. I apologize. I didn't know that you were uh, like going back and kind of making like a second edition and then editing it again. Uh, but, uh, you know, he created a formula. It spits out, you know, is this is Chipper Jones better than, uh, you know, uh, Nolan Arenado is is Greg Maddox better than Randy Johnson is, uh, you know, and things like that. And it's uh, me and my friends growing up, at least, you know, we would always we had our favorites. We'd always be comparing you know, no, my guy's better because he hit 300 and had 30 homers and 100 RBIs for seven straight years. And, you know, your guy only had 25 homers. And, you know, this this formula that he created could kind of help settle those debates in a sense and, and show you through math uh, that, you know, player X was just a hair better than player Y. You know, he he was ranked 10th and this guy's ranked 11th or, you know, um, that you you understand what i'm trying to get across there like uh right. the, there's an incredible accomplishment by pete uh, and it's in, it's very very interesting if you if you're into that kind of analytical side of the sport which if you're a baseball fan you probably are because there are s seven million stats they use for baseball that have acronyms that just blow my mind uh, <laughs> i can't even keep Bad up bit. with some of them like yeah you got yeah. You know, exit velocity and velo and ERA and, uh, you know, war and X war and FIP and X FIP and WRC plus. And, you know, all the, all those aren't just random things. I'm saying those are actually stats and yeah. baseball. Mm -hmm. Pete found a way to kind of implement all of that into a formula and spit out, you know, who is give, give, give them a little something. Who's the number one player in baseball all time, according to the formula. So, you know, I separated it between position players oh, yes. and yes. pitchers yes. Uh, because part of the whole formula involves direct comparison. Right. And you can't directly compare a second baseman to a pitcher. Uh, right. So as far as pitchers go and as far as position players go, my top guys on each category, and this is, again, their best careers, 
You could argue that someone else is better than them, but as far as their <laughs> career goes, in comparison to everyone else that played, number one pitcher, Roger Clemens, number one position player, Barry Bonds. And that's a can of worms wow. all to itself. Right, but, <laughs> right. That seems but, like you just wanted hot takes with that one. Uh, I, I, am, right. I am not displeased with that <laughs> with those results. Uh, I did nothing. It's totally blind. I don't even right. know right. who's who. The formula spits it all out. Uh, there was no need to apologize. It updates every year, obviously, because, you know, that's another year right. of history being added to the game. But, uh, and you know, guys like games. Mike Trout yeah. continue to climb up the list. Uh, every season he plays, he moves up. So tony has got to be high. Otani's career is still early, but it's getting right. there. It's absolutely uh, getting there. Uh, but, yeah, uh, that's something I would like. I think even works better as something like, you know, YouTube or a website because, you know, you print the book. The very next year, it's kind of it not changes. accurate anymore. Yeah. Right. So, so thanks for bringing all that up. That's that's uh, it's that's super nice. interesting. Yeah. If any of you have, if you want to have some fun talks and and get some cool info, hit Pete up on Facebook or you know, uh, uh, yeah, hit us in the comment section. On, anything uh, yeah, you'd like on to do. Twitter, yeah. on Twitter, anything. But yeah, I'll definitely get the word to him. But uh, baseball is a lot of fun. I'm already looking forward to next season. Uh, you know, we still got. Winter, you know, free agent signings and and a few more months. It'll be here before we know it. Spring training is is right around the corner. So uh, we just wanted to give everybody a little baseball preview. Um, and uh, we hope you enjoyed. Uh, follow us on Catching Flies W1 on Twitter or follow me, Stephen Burton, on Facebook or Pete on Facebook. Um, that's really about all I got. Pete, you want to take it home? Sure. Just want to thank everyone that uh, took it down uh, with us today. Lasted the entire show with us. Um, Spotify, YouTube, feel free on YouTube, especially to like, share, and subscribe. We greatly appreciate it. We'd like to build our platform up a little bit, reach as many people as we can, because we want people to argue with us and get mad at us. We want trolls. Right. You know, we want people, want people coming at us. <laughs> we, <laughs> we love the support we've received so far, but I think you know you made it when someone comes at you. <laughs> right. So, right. so uh, no, in, in all sincerity and all genuineness, uh, we thank everybody for for sticking with us and anything you'd like to hear from us we are planning on coming back next week topic yet to be determined we have a couple of ideas but we'll see where the sports world what direction it might point us in to help us uh determine a topic but that said we thank you for listening for steven burton this is pete mccottis signing off for this week thank you again go catch some flies